The NBA's had a pretty wild 72 hours, whether that be with the NBA draft just finishing up last night, or whether that be with some pretty major trades that's going to change the landscape of the league. So today I just want to hop on here, talk to you about the draft, and talk to you about some of the big trades that happened. And what better place to start than with the New York Knicks, who made a blockbuster trade on Tuesday night by trading for Mikel Bridges of the Brooklyn Nets and sending the Nets' Bojan Bogdanovic four unprotected first-round picks, a protected 2025 Milwaukee first-round pick, a pick swap in 2028, and a second-rounder for next year. I know what you're thinking. That is a lot to give up for Mikel Bridges. And I'm thinking the same thing. Mikel Bridges is a great player. We've seen him thrive in many different situations, whether that be in Phoenix as a third or sometimes fourth option, or whether that be in Brooklyn as sometimes the primary option. And while his last season in Brooklyn wasn't the best, Mikel is still a very valuable player who will play all 82 games, give you consistent effort, give you a pretty solid scoring option, and he can really be the game changer for this New York Knicks team, especially considering that his salary sits at around $23 million a year. That's a bargain, especially considering what contracts are going up to nowadays. Mikel Bridges is going to be a piece on this Knicks team long term that will really help them out. And I don't think anyone's going to question that. Mikel Bridges obviously has the chemistry ties with Jalen Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo, former teammates at Villanova, of course, Josh Hart, um, former Villanova teammates in college, and now reunited with the Knicks. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun to watch the Knicks next year. I don't think anyone's arguing that point. But what I think a lot of people are going to overlook because of the great fit that Mikel Bridges has on the Knicks is what the Knicks gave up for Mikel Bridges. I mean, if you think about it, Bojan Bogdanovic was traded at the trade deadline this year, and Alec Burks, who's also a part of that deal with Bojan Bogdanovic, he's probably going to be gone from the team because the Knicks do not want to hit that second apron with the cap. So if you think about it, if you combine those two trades, essentially the Knicks gave up Quentin Grimes, six first-round picks, and three second-round picks for Mikel Bridges. Just Mikel Bridges. That's a lot of value for a guy who might not be the number one option on your team. And like I said before, I think Mikel Bridges will be very valuable with the Knicks. But six first round picks is a lot for Mikel Bridges. Let me say though, the counter argument to that. The Knicks have been very smart with their picks recently. They've been trading out, they've been trading down over the past couple of drafts, accumulating draft capital so that they can cash in their chips. And they thought Mikel Bridges was the missing piece. And I'm not going to argue with them because Mikel Bridges has shown that he can fit into many different situations. And with the chemistry already there with the three Villanova teammates on the roster, I think it's going to be a great fit. But in retrospect, when we forget about those trades, this is going to look crazy. Six first round picks for Mikel Bridges, that's a lot. And just as an overall view of the Knicks, if you were to look at their potential starting five, it's probably going to be Brunson at the one, Bridges at the two, I guess, Ananobi at the three, Randall at the four, and Hartenstein at the five. That's a really solid starting five. It might be, it might rival the Celtics for the best starting five in the league. But there is one little catch that I think, I think something's going to happen with the starting five. I don't... I don't see Julius Randle being a long-term fit for the Knicks. And I, I, that's not a hot take, of course, because Randle's been in trade rumors for years now on the Knicks, but he just does not fit with this team. And I hate the conversations around Randle because I feel like people are diminishing his value because the Knicks looked so good in the playoffs without him. But man, I just, it, it, he doesn't fit with how the team will play basketball. He's very ISO heavy. He, he needs the ball in his hands to deliver. And with a guy like Jalen Brunson on your team who showed when Randall went down that he is like MVP caliber when he has the ball in his hands. And then you have complementary pieces on the offensive side of the ball like Bridges and Ananobi. You have Hartenstein who's a pretty solid offensive threat at the center position. I don't know where Randall fits there. And I'm not going to say trade Randall right now. I'd like to see how Randall fits with that starting lineup. But I think it'll be interesting to view that situation. Um, there's certainly been rumors of Randall getting traded for Cat before the season started. I don't think the Timberwolves give up Cat at this point after their great run. But I would not be shocked if this time next year Randall's on the move or if he's already been traded. I don't know what the return could possibly be for Julius Randle, but if there's a disgruntled superstar in this league, trust me, you're going to see Julius Randle in a lot of trade talks. 
And one final thing on the Knicks before I wrap up with them. Um, the cap concerns, I, I mentioned it earlier. I don't know how they get this team to be as good as it is while not going over the second apron. And I think you could attribute that to Jalen Brunson taking a little pay cut. Um, Mikel Bridges, as I mentioned before, only around $23 million a year. There's rumors that Hartenstein's probably going to have to take a pay cut, and he probably will to be a part of such a great team. Um, Mitchell Robinson might be on the move, and I don't know if that's a good... Th- well, let me rephrase that. I don't know if this is a good thing for the Knicks that Mitchell Robinson's on the move. Obviously, Robinson's had his problems with injuries in the past couple of years. A couple of season-ending injuries um, unfortunately took him out, but... I don't know, man. I don't know if they can get through a playoff series with just Hartenstein as a big. Because if you look at their uh, potential bench, it's probably McBride, DiVincenzo, and Hart. If you go on a playoff series, eight-man rotation. I don't know if they can get by with just one center. But that all, of course, just remains to be seen in the future. Right now, what we can talk about is the NBA draft. Now, the first round of the NBA draft, I think, was really interesting. That's what I'm going to focus most of my time on here today. Uh, let's start out the top. The number one overall pick, Zachary Risache. I don't know if that was too much of a surprise. There were pretty much rumors swirling all around that it was going to be Risache. And I, I personally, in my mock draft, I took Donovan Klingon. I still would have gone that route. I think Donovan Klingon, a great NBA ready player who really would have fit the Hawks. I'm not too mad at the Risa Shea pick, especially considering that Alex Sar refused to work out for the Hawks. You don't want to take a risk on that guy, so I'm okay with Risa Shea going at one, but obviously when you look at the, the past draft classes with Wemby going one, Paolo going one, Cade going one, like these are guys who made like an instant impact on the franchise and on the city. These are guys who have star potential and guys who could lead those pr- franchises to potential playoff wins. Um, I don't think Risa Shea is ever going to be that guy, and I think that's okay. I think we all kind of came into this draft expecting that the number one overall pick was not going to be that franchise-altering guy. If Risa Shea can become a solid three, and maybe even a two, I don't think he can really reach the heights of becoming a solid two on a championship team. But if it could become a three or a four on a championship team, I'd call this a success for a Hawks. Um, Risa Shea certainly has his concerns. He's labeled as a shooter, but he definitely struggled near the back half of the year with his shooting percentages. Um, I do think the defense will be there. I think there was really no other option than Risa Shea other than Klingon, who I would have gone with, but I don't think they wanted to be the mocking, uh, the laughing stock of Twitter if they took Donovan Klingon first overall. I don't think people would have been very happy about that. So, Risa Shea going one, I, I guess it's fine. Number two, Alex Starr, pretty chalk. Uh, my opinion's kind of changed on Axar in the past couple of days. I've been watching a little more film. Uh, not too impressed, honestly, but hey, he's got potential. That's the one thing he's got, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I think for the Wizards, a team that doesn't really have an identity right now, especially after trading away Denny Evdia. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I think Alex Starr was the right pick. I think he's got potential. Um, personally, I don't think he's going to be one of the better prospects from this class. But he certainly has the potential to become one of the best prospects in this class. So it's all just a waiting game for the top two guys. Number three was Reed Shepard to the Rockets. Again, expected. I think it's a good pick. Um, some of the rumors with them were pretty crazy about acquiring Kevin Durant. That's that was kind of out of nowhere. I don't, I don't, I don't know where they got that in their mind that they were going to get Kevin Durant. Um, but uh, that, was, that gave me a good laugh. But Reed Shepard going three. I think th- that was a chalk pick. Great shooter, solid defender, size concerns, but that's okay. And honestly, I think I think he'll be a good fit in Houston. So, good pick, Houston. Good job. Fourth overall pick, Stefan Castle to the Spurs. Perfect. I love Stefan Castle. He's my favorite prospect from this year's draft. He great defender, great attacker at the rim. He's going to fit perfectly with Wemby. I mean, this guy is Wemby's dream to play with. So, I am extremely excited to see Stefan Castle in a Spurs uniform. Um, and this is where I really want to talk about things here. Pick number five, a shock to me and a shock to many. Uh, a lot of people were expecting Modest Buzelis to go fifth overall to the Detroit Pistons, but instead they took his teammate, Ron Holland. Um, I'm not too mad at the pick. Ron Holland has a lot of potential. Uh, athletic freak, pretty solid defender coming into the league. I think he's, I think he's a good player. It's just they did not 
the Pistons didn't need Ron Holland. I don't, I don't really get the pick. I understand how or why you would like Ron Holland. I mean, he's he's an incredible player, incredible prospect, especially in this year's draft. But man, I don't. They need shooting on that team. Cade Cunningham is an incredible facilitator, and he can't just facilitate by, I don't know, uh, getting guys cutting to the basket. You know, eventually it's gonna get uh, it's gonna get scouted on by teams. They're going to realize, hey, there's not really a good three-point shooter on this team surrounding a really solid playmaker. We don't really need to guard that, you know? Teams are going to dare Asar Thompson. They're going to dare Ron Holland to shoot. And it's probably going to work, you know? I, of course, Modest Buzelis wasn't going to fix that problem immediately, but at least he had shown flashes of shooting the ball, of being a threat from behind the arc, you know? Ron Holland isn't really known for that. I think it's going to be interesting to see where the Pistons really take this. I understand why they took Ron Holland, but at the same time, I don't, if that makes any sense. So, moving on. We'll get to the sixth overall pick now. The Hornets, another surprise pick here. Dijon Salon. Um, I had him going seventh in my mock, not because I liked him as a prospect, but because I thought someone would buy into the potential. He's a good prospect. He, he looked pretty good, honestly, from what I saw. I wasn't able to catch many full games, but I saw a lot of highlights. He looked, obviously the highlights make any player look good, but from his highlights, he showed a lot of potential, man. Um, at first, I was very anti this pick, you know. I thought the Hornets probably could have traded down to a round pick, a late lottery maybe, maybe even a nine if the Grizzlies wanted to trade up. Of course, I'm not a GM. I don't know what how these conversations go. I don't, I don't know what the Pistons were trying to get for, uh, or I'm sorry, what the Hornets were trying to get by trading down to number nine, what the Grizzlies were willing to give up. Obviously, it didn't work out, so I'm not going to be too harsh on the Hornets here for not being able to trade down. Um, but they got their guy. I think that's fine. I didn't like the pick because I thought it was a reach at first, but then when you think about it, um, the people the people on the Hornets who are pretty much locks to stay there are LaMelo and Brandon Miller. Um, Tijon Salon, he slides into the four position, and what really impressed me was his off-the-ball movement on both sides of the ball, and I think he's really going to thrive in that role. Um, at first, I was very anti this pick, but the more I've thought about it, the more I really like it, actually, because I think LaMelo and Brandon Miller are obviously going to need to dominate the ball. I mean, not Brandon Miller as much, but LaMelo, of course. I think Tijon Salon will be a great pick here. I... I don't know. I think there's obviously bust potential with him because he doesn't have uh, the highest floor. He has probably one of the lowest floors that have anyone taken in the first round. But the ceiling is there. And if LaMelo and Brandon Miller can unlock that, maybe take some of the stress off of him as a sixth overall pick, uh, just let him play his game. I mean, hey, anything can happen, really. And I, I like Tijon Salon. And then we get to the seventh overall pick with Donovan Klingon going to the Portland Trailblazers now. I'm not going to talk about any of the center concerns. I am not a big DeAndre Ayton guy. I'm not a big Robert Williams guy either. I think both of them are talented, but both of them have their specific problems, whether that be um, injury concerns with Robert Williams and effort concerns with DeAndre Ayton. I'm um, not a big fan of either of those guys, so I am a fan of Donovan Klingon going here. I think he's going to be a great fit there. Um, wouldn't be shocked if Ayton or Williams gets traded, or maybe even both. Um... What's to talk about here is the trade that the Trailblazers made with the Washington Wizards. Um, Trailblazers got Denny Avdia, one of my favorite players in the league. Uh, well, not favorite, but a guy that I recognize is extremely underrated. Um, and one of the guys that I was really looking forward to seeing on the Washington Wizards as they go through a rebuild. Um, really a shocking trade, honestly. I really like... Danny Avdia last year. I thought he showed a lot of improvement from his previous years. And sure, he wasn't the best coming into the NBA, but man, that's he's only 23 years old now. And you're trading him for, I, I believe it was 14, Malcolm Brogdon and a future pick. You know, not the worst return, of course, but Malcolm Brogdon, he's probably not on that team next year. 14, they got, uh, we'll talk about pick number 14 later with the Wizards, but they got a guy I really like. And then a future first, I mean, you, you are in a rebuild, so I understand getting the return, but giving up on a 23-year-old who showed a lot of potential last year, who might have even been your best player last year, I don't know. I I don't completely understand it. I'm not I'm not going to sit up here and say that the Washington Wizards uh, 
made a great trade here. I think I think the Portland Trailblazers won that trade. Um, and I think Denny Avdia is going to do incredible on that team. He doesn't need the ball to thrive. Of course, Scoot Henderson didn't have a great rookie year last year, but I'm a believer that he will turn it around. You have Anthony Simons, Shaden Sharp, and now Denny Avdia. Like, those are four guys all below the age of 25 years old. And if you uh, take out Simons, three guys under the age of 23 who can really thrive and could be a part of this team's future. I mean, I think I think that's a great trade, honestly. And I think the Trailblazers here, uh, with Klingon especially too, I think the Trailblazers, um, I don't think they're going to compete in the West this year, but I wouldn't be shocked if they get up to maybe like the 13th or maybe even the 12th seed, depending on how Scoot Henderson plays. So I like the trade for the uh, Portland Trailblazers. Washington, a little bit head scratching, but if you do want to reset, I could understand it. Got a pretty decent return. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then at number eight, Rob Dillingham uh, to the Spurs or to the Timberwolves. Great fit. Rob Dillingham, offensive bucket. He's going to be great. Timberwolves need a point guard. Mike Conley still probably going to start for the next couple of years, but Rob Dillingham coming off the bench is going to be great. And eventually when he starts, that backcourt with Anthony Edwards is going to be incredible. So I like the trade for the Timberwolves. And they didn't really give up that much. Only gave up a future pick and a pick swap, I believe. So... Good trade, honestly. I, I like it for the Timberwolves. Kind of head scratching for the uh, for the Spurs, but I'm not going to question it. What you know, they do whatever they want. What's really head scratching to me was pick number nine. Now I understand that the Memphis Grizzlies needed a center, right? They definitely wanted to trade up, get Donovan Klingon at number six. That fell through. Totally understandable. So why do you draft Zach Eady at nine? I understand you need a center. I think if you traded down to like 17, maybe, I, I don't know if, I think 17 was a Lakers. I don't know if they were going to trade up. I mean, it, just with the idea, you know, if they had traded back down to late teens, I think Zach E was still going to be there. I don't know how many teams would have picked him. Um, I think Miami Heat took Khalil Ware. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit too, but there, that was a center taken. But other than that, you know. I don't know, man. I don't I don't know if Zach Eady was really worth the ninth overall pick. You really went through all of those troubles, those injury troubles, the entire season being thrown away with John Morant's suspension and then injury, uh, just an all-around chaotic season. You threw all of that season away last year just to get Zach Eady at number nine, a guy who you could, probably could have gotten at 19. I don't know, man. I, I don't like the pick. I think Zach Eady's going to be a productive player in the NBA, don't get me wrong. This isn't an attack on Zach Eady, the prospect. I think he's still a pretty solid prospect. This is an attack on the Memphis Grizzlies front office. They should not have made this pick. They should have traded down, or at least found a way to trade down, take your guy. And if he's not there, um, there's other centers in this draft who, they might not be as productive as Zach Eady eventually, or coming out the gates but eventually maybe they could be so kind of a head scratching pick there from the memphis grizzlies and then from pick 10 on you know i noticed kind of a trend with this draft right from pick 10 to pick i'll say pick 19 really good selections from all the gms cody williams at 10 to the jazz perfect incredible number 11 Matas buzelis comes home to chicago amazing i did not expect him to fall that far and i don't think the bulls did either Great pick by the Bulls. Number 12, Nikola Topic. This was a pick that uh, a pick that I was fearing that the Jazz would take. Well, the Thunder took it, and that might be worse. I mean, they are stocking so much talent over the next couple of years. When Topic comes back in probably two years, that team is going to be unstoppable. Um, I will fear for Nikola Topic's development, considering that he's behind like three guards already in the depth chart, and then he's coming off an ACL tear. Um... But, I mean, if he can live up to the hype, and from what I've seen from him, he is going to be incredible on that Thunder team. And that Thunder team is definitely going to compete when he comes back. Um, Devin Carter at four, or 13, excuse me. Devin Carter at 13 to the Kings. Perfect. They just traded uh, Davion Mitchell to the Raptors for pretty much nothing. Uh, that was a salary dump, pretty much. I mean, that's fine. Devin Carter pretty much takes those minutes anyway. And he's really solid. He's better than, he might be better than Davion Mitchell is right now. So... Good pick there, 14, Bub Carrington. I was going to talk about that with the Wizards. Great pick there. That's a guy who you could potentially build around. He's only, uh, I believe he just turned 19. He might be still 18, but a lot of potential there. And then 15, Khalil Ware, at probably the my least liked pick from 10 through 19, but still a good pick nonetheless. Still a lot of potential there. 
Um, I don't know if the fit with Miami is going to work necessarily, but he is an athletic freak. He's someone who has all the physicals to succeed in the league. So I think that'll be interesting to see. 16, Jared McCain. I really like Jared McCain. I think he's a great prospect. The fact that the 76ers got him is a little... um, That's a great sign for you, 76ers fans. That's a great pickup. I mean, that's a lethal shooter, a solid defender, and that's a leader right there. I think I think he's going to be great with the Sixers. And 17, Dalton Connect. Again, another guy that fell to the Lakers at 17. He's going to be great. Instant impact for the Lakers, a team that wants to contend with LeBron. Um, number 18, Tristan De Silva, a guy who I really like going to the Orlando Magic. Someone who looked pretty good in the conference tournament and NCAA tournament. A guy who I thought could have uh, very easily gone in the lottery, and I would not have been mad at it. He's a solid uh, solid forward there. And then 19, to wrap it all up with the teens, Jacoby Walter for the Toronto Raptors. I'm a Raptors fan. I'm a big fan of this pick. I was secretly hoping he'd fall to us, and he did. He's a really all-around threat who has a lot of potential, man. I, I could really see him being a threat in this league in just a couple years. So, picks 10 through 19, really solid. And I think that's going to be the overall theme from this draft. Because when you look at the draft, the consensus was heading into it that it was going to be one of the weakest classes we've ever seen. I think I disagree with that. And here's why. The top-end talent might be some of the weakest we've ever seen. But then, as I just said before, picks 10 through 19, I think those guys could come in and contribute on playoff teams right away. I think those guys are going to be big factors for the teams that they play with. And I think, overall, that's what this draft is going to be remembered for. We're probably not going to remember Risa Shea and Saar. What we're going to remember are the guys picked in the mid to late teens. Those guys, instant impact guys who can come in on teams who may have had a down year last year. Who can come in on teams that are now going to be contending. Guys who can come in and potentially help those contending teams win a title. I do not think this was a weak draft class. I think the top was weak. I think... When you look at some of the guys in this class, even some of the top guys too, like Castle, like uh, Holland, I think is a great, great prospect. I think Shepard's a great prospect. Um, I think those guys, those guys have the potential to be successful in the draft. But when you look at them compared to previous years, of course, it's going to be weaker. Then you look through 10 through 19, and I think those guys, if you put them in last year's draft, I think they could go exactly in that order. I think those guys, if you look at the guys in the teens and the late 20s, those guys I think are better than the talent that was drafted in those positions last year. I think these guys now could help a team compete, could play in a playoff series immediately. And I think that's what we're going to remember this draft class for. Guys, they may not be the stars, but guys who are going to come in, be role players, be quality starters in this league one day. And I think that's okay. We need drafts like that every once in a while. We need role players in this league for this league to succeed. And I think some of the guys that were just drafted are going to be guys who are going to be hearing for a long time in the NBA. I definitely thought this was going to be one of the shorter videos I've ever published, but hey, it's been about 25 minutes. So thank you so much for staying along for the ride if you're here at this point. Um, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It lets me know that you like this type of content, and I really do appreciate all the support that I've been getting recently. So thank you so much. Leave a like, subscribe, comment down below some of your favorite draft prospects here. Tell me some of the fits that you like, some of the fits you don't like, some of the picks that uh, you were pretty mind-boggled at, like Zach Eady at number 9. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and I'll be back in a couple days with free agency reactions.